we might just get on with things again. <laughs> Calm yourself. Um, we were just waiting to see if some of the other sessions had finished, but we might just... They haven't finished. Well, they can miss out, sorry. You know, they, they should have got here. Um, we just want to wrap up the conference, really, uh, now. Um, as a lot of you will know, Andy Fenton uh, is stepping down from the board this year after, I think, 10 years on the board, um, including many as the treasurer. He has sort of been the institutional memory of, of the board, so it's with some trepidation that we farewell him. Um, we still know where he lives, so that's, um, we won't be letting him get away. Um, so Andy's going to do a bit of a wrap-up for us, um, so please welcome Andy to the stage. G'day everyone. I'm just going to try and attempt to read my notes off my laptop. I had my daughter's Microsoft Surface all cleared up for this, but um, technology got the better of me. It shouldn't do here. Um, it's been a fabulous couple of days, I'm sure you'll agree, and I'll start, in case I forget at the end, with a massive thank you to Matthew. Um, I don't think we would have um, seen anything quite as fantastic as this without all his efforts and those of his team and those at the board who were supporting him as well. So a big shout out to Matthew, please. <laughs> The board's aim for this conference was to delight and inspire and see how we can network together to enhance New Zealand's digital interaction with culture and heritage to make a difference. And key themes that inspired or transpired for me were inspiration, dream and challenge. And these are words that do come up um, uh, in conferences across the years. This is my 12th, by the way. Um, I'll touch on these themes as I sum up. Firstly, some thoughts and quotes from our keynotes. I just want to take you back over the last couple of days. Simon Tanner reminded us that we spend an enormous amount of money in the digital space, but how do we know we've actually made an impact that's meaningful and will, pay, uh, will change people's lives? Likewise, uh, we often hear fabulous statistics about how many objects or elements of objects we have digitized. You know, the paper's passed one, uh, multiple three million uh, pages and so on. Um, but do the numbers mean anything? Do they just show the scale of the project or the effort to maintain open access to these or the difficulty in preserving them? It's the impact on people's lives that's important and the tangible benefits they provide. So knowledge of stakeholders is crucial and we should look at measuring success for impact internally, innovatively, economically, and socially. And you've got uh, Simon's slides to refer back to there. Peter Gorgel's pushed a traditional boundary. High quality art picks free online. Uh, always provokes uh, great debate. I love it. After all, it is the people's collection, he told us, and they should enjoy it any time, any place, any way they want to. You need to think about that when you go home and look at your own institution. Make commercial gain from those images. How cool is that? Well, for someone like myself, it's probably cooler than for some of you. <laughs> um, I'd like to point out that he made the point that um, the average online visit to uh, his place increased to 15 minutes as people explored those images in detail. And is that really what it's all about? The economic impact on the revenue stream for you smaller institutions will be thinking through. And there is a challenge there, I appreciate that. Deb Howe's brought education thinking here, and it's something the board's pushed over the years um, to get that education perspective on glam sector views. Um, most of their efforts were concentrated on the 3 million, a staggering number of annual visitors to MoMA. Uh, but when you've got 20 million annual online visitors, uh, what can you do to offer more to them? So thinking in the education space, she told us about offering courses online, the use of MOOCs, massive open online classrooms, which clearly are growing phenomenally well. Um, and also the point that we need to consider back converting our metadata terminology to match what kids and teachers and researchers search for. She also touched on the use of smartphones, ubiquitous. In fact, how many got smartphones in this audience? Yeah, a staggering number. Um, I heard on the radio just this morning that apparently the take up of smartphones on a mass scale, defined mass, uh, across the world is probably f about five years, maybe seven at most. Uh, the take up of the internet was about 10 years. So imagine when we get the next breakthrough, just how fast technology is changing for us and what that can do to the areas we work in. But MOOC education is clearly uh, growing massively. It provides uh, wonderful outcomes, global reach, homebound folk can learn, or people who just can't travel that well. The opportunity for connecting and teaching the teachers is quite high on my agenda. Imagine reaching out to 10,000 teachers in an audience of 17,000 from 110 countries. 
But challenges do remain. Uh, we asked about universities, uh, and um, Deb's challenged academia to think of MOOCs as a textbook, which I thought was quite inspiring. And perhaps an education sweet spot is that global digital reach, to do that via collaboration, by harvesting content, by repurposing metadata, sharing data. The outcomes are engage and to inform. The impact will manifestly be life-changing if education standards are lifted more rapidly on a global scale. Now I think of continents like Africa where even smartphones are quite, uh, becoming quite prevalent over there, and just how much we can do in the education space there. Ed Summers reminded us that the web and the digital ecosystems we operate in are vast, and we need to care for the web, uh, archive it, protect it, be islands of persistence on the web, even our own website iterations, your own namespace, if you like. Is it important to manage and remember that? And I think a lot of the early NDFs were about digital preservation um, and in included talks on archiving the web. Um, we seem to have moved on from that conversation, but I'm really pleased Ed came and reminded us just how important it is. I think in the digital age, we, um, we can get a bit frivolous. Are we kidding ourselves on being islands of persistence? We can't really compete with Google, can we? Uh, the sheer scale of the job is massive. Um, you've got Library of Congress offering the Twitter archive. Uh, but maybe we can just look for sweet spots, as Ed told us. Um, rise to the challenge, after all. When you go to a library, you don't expect the librarian to read a book to you. I contend we need to be curatorial and consider what information we discard. Uh, we generate lots of data, but keep throwing lots away. That's not always OK. But if cultural heritage institutions don't try to keep it, then who will? Especially in this advent period of the internet, the first three decades, you could argue. But let's do our best until the cavalry arrives, perhaps. I've observed the rise in the, internet, in the interest in digital humanities, which didn't even exist when NDF was first conceived. Many of the presentations touched on the application of digital technology on humanities disciplines, and the opportunity to reflect upon the impact digital media has upon humanity. Not surprising, this has clear compatibility with NDF's own goals to enhance New Zealand's digital interaction with culture and heritage, to make a difference. And that touched me on the matter of perspective. I think uh, many of us in the Twitter sphere enjoyed Simon's wine analogy. Is the value the wine, the glass, or in the drinking? Different people have different perspectives, and it's important to try and understand and comprehend as many as possible. But our job is to think strategically, to assess the risks, to consider the stakeholders, to accept the impact can be positive or negative. And it's to ask the uh, right questions at the start. In other words, to quote Simon again, um, be clear and deliberate about what you do in the digital realm and why. A related thought that resonated for me was that this indeed, uh, uh, that it is indeed almost an impossible mandate for national institutions to hold data in perpetuity on a one to three year budget cycle. It's also crazy to fund a digitization project as a one-off event and not a sustained activity over time. And we must uh, transform program, uh, sorry, projects into programs of digitization. Adrian Kingston and Chris Dempsey both made the point regarding crowdsourcing, and I just heard Reed Perkins talk about it as well. Um, crowdsourcing or user contribution. Just a few champions can make a significant difference. Find those in your community and stakeholders and yourself will collectively make a big impact. And again, I reiterate that we need to plan to manage content beyond initial capture. We've heard Joe talk about Kete and the dilemma it's got at the moment. It's important uh, that we manage the content beyond uh, the initial conception of the project. Full lifespan considerations. Adrian reminded us that if our audiences are prepared to give us our opinions, we should respect them and care for them and learn from them. And I was quite moved by that. Remember some other important lessons about community. Uh, the gamers are big players in this space. That pun was intended. And um, Helen Stuckey's method of remembering games is transferable to preserving your community memory and knowledge, perhaps. Preserving and sharing community experiences is important. And I did like Helen's aside that if you work in digital preservation, you get rather fond of paper. Similarly, several speakers inspired my own thoughts about the democratization of information, a phrase Penny um, put on national radio some years ago um, and has been widely used. Linked open data is an amazing yet elusive idea, as Chris McDowell told us. And Michael Lascarides, who was a keynote speaker here just a few years ago from America uh, and now a resident here, showed us how to make a start on this seemingly too big to tackle task. 
And by democratizing information, we must remain mindful of community in place. Consider iwi and the marae in the digital era. The values of belonging and identity for Maori uh, resonate in cultural heritage digitization projects. And I loved Paul Tapsell's message that digitally grounding tamariki to their own home marae is critical to future Maori well-being in a world of global confusion. And that wonderful quip that if you have the tools, use them. Uh, do you think that if Maori had uh, early Maori had outboard motors, they would not have used them? It's about community. I think I pushed the wrong button. Um, place and community can be bridged in the digital realm. For example, from the Marae, uh, well, Paul Tapsell's Marae, to the sign language archive uh, from Sonia Pivak who equally inspired me with this nation's third official language. I find it hard to get my head around a language which has no written form. It's only recorded in video over the years, or its various formats, so preserving that audio and visual material is crucial. And a big uh, or shout out from me to the work from the New Zealand found archi Film Archive and Sound Archive, and the work they do in preserving degrading acetate film, and many more organisations like my own firm, who do the same for those acetate photo negatives we need to catch before they crinkle. Thank you, Deaf Radio, for creating the sign DNA, an archive for sign language, a virtual land for the deaf community. And thank you for providing interpreters here on stage. In fact, they probably deserve a clap for guys. <laughs> Sticking with community in place, I was as moved as you were by Courtney this morning. All heritage institutions can embrace emotion if they so choose, reflective of the people and collections within, and the people they wish to offer an experience to, their community. I loved how Courtney intuitively jumped straight to impact, how she might change people's lives through her institution's values. This is part dream, part challenge, and certainly inspiring for me, as I hope it is for you. And I was also equally inspired by Virginia's 100 years ago, 100 years ago talk with Kirsty which was Dub Dub 100 collaborating with Te Papa, of course. Many speakers provoke challenges, inspirations, and dreams, and I throw these out there. The right to delete as well as preserve. Is that really new in the curatorial world? Seems to be a big hang up in the digital world. How do we educate young people as the real and virtual worlds blur uh, previous moral codes, as Hannah McDougall told us? And that nice Quote from uh, Tom Rennie, e-books seem to be 15 years behind the web, and though we partied hard in 1999, it seems rather quaint today. What can we do about open standards with e-books, eh? Hmm. I love the mashups, uh, the Rijksmuseum video. Now, we can all have some fun there, even with a simple smartphone, Mina. Can you foresee your institution open up your entire digital collection free and high res? Who pays? Who's already paid for some of that digitization and perhaps owns it already? And a nice concept to consider, added value for users, uh, which we got um, from the Rijksmuseum again. The intersection of museum, user trends, and tools is their sweet spot. But added value to users, I think, is something we should all focus on. And I learned a new word, culture snacker. I um, haven't worked out if it's one or two, but I quite like it as a single word, hashtag. So in closing, I'd like to pick up on Penny's opening challenges and dreams. You control the information information age. I had to get a McCann in because everyone else has. Mm. And uh, I, I'm certainly no study of art history, um, but I did pick up this quote about this painting, and uh, I think that really resonates with me and what we're talking about here. I hope you enjoy that. And that is a screen dump, so I don't think I've breached any copyright issues, because your papa told me I had to pay for it if I downloaded it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think the earthquakes in Christchurch proved how important it is to preserve digitally. Uh, further, that because, our NDF because of our NDF initiatives, we could connect, research, learn and discover about the information surrounding that event and that's impact. Some years ago, policy was developed, as Penny told us, and shaped strategic thinking. It gave impact, as Simon Tanner would say, because it helped us develop programs that would change people's lives. Penny challenged whether we now need to think about how serious we want to get about open access, open data, and the creative commons. Should this be funded by the government? Not the least, because so much of the infrastructure is underpinned by it. And I agree, let's get serious about preserving digital scientific research and pushing the boundary on copyright. And as for you and the NDF board, 
some nostalgia from me, not much. Um, Matapihi off-sited at uh, NDF because it was our first collective project. It was a pretty cool outcome, I must confess. It's an outcome of the first conference in 2001, inspired by an Australian case study. Great example of collaboration and networking. Picked up by Graham Cohen, Steve Knight, and we ran with it. And it inspired the formation of NDF as we know it today. Seddon Bennington and Paul Reynolds are often remembered at these conferences, and I think the phrase for me today is, lest we forget. Um, they, uh, Penny, Graham and Steve, were early inspirers of the NDF. Coming Home was our first, or sorry, our second big collaborative project. Uh, and as Andy told us at the AGM, it uh, uh, coincided with the formation of Digital New Zealand. Nowadays, World War I is galvanising cross-sectoral collaboration on a grander scale, as Virginia showed us. I'd like to offer a shout out to Digital New Zealand. Uh, for us early NDF board members, it was everything NDF saw itself being. But it actually did stuff. Still does it, and better than we ever imagined. Chalk that up to Penny's Imagineering, her word, uh, her digital leadership team of Sue Sutherland and John Truesdale, along with the NDF board just conceptualising in the background there. So to you all, please, read the survey, digitisation survey that's on the NDF website. Read the monthly newsletters. A lot of work goes into them. We're communicating better nowadays. Bar camps and experience exchange we've talked about, but we're trying to develop a sense of community beyond this conference, and it's important. You may have other ideas. Become a member of the uh, NDF if you're not already uh, uh, one already. You can join on the website. Work with fellow members. Work with the board. Don't leave it all to them. For me, I love the maturity about NDF and its 12th conference. Change is a wonderful constant, but the one thing that has been consistent across all those conferences is the present brain ache most of us experience at the end of day one, and I mean before the drinks. The cerebral stretching from the rock stars of our sectors ferment great ideas and inspiration. I think you'll all agree that whilst our overseas guests were fantastic, the Kiwis were brilliant too, and the Aussies. NDF brought community to, dig uh, to digitisation in New Zealand. I think that's a fair sum up of what I saw NDF doing over the last 12 years. It's got us to a good stage and there's lots of work still to be done. It's a digital place where geeks can be cool and heck, you can even use tablets and laptops in the front row here without complaint. Although, do dim your lights, please. Um, it's a place where bibliophiles can read, museum folks can visit and explore, archivists can collect. And collectively, we glam sectorites can live a dream where our data is connected, contextualised, entertaining, informative, accessible for as long as we need it. So I'll close with a graphic demonstration of the community we inspire. I contacted Michael Edson, who was a keynote speaker here two or three years ago with Michael, I believe, um, just a few hours ago, and asked him to help me close this conference with those key three, uh, key themes that transpired for me, inspiration, dream, and challenge. And here's what we came up with. Hi, everyone. When Andy messaged me a few minutes ago to ask me to comment on the conference themes, I thought he said they were instigation, scheme, and malice. And I thought, wow, um, that's awesome. But things have changed a lot in the last couple of years in New Zealand. Um, and now I understand that the themes are inspiration, dream, and challenge. And uh, those are big, loaded, emotional words. Um, they speak to me of a group of people who uh, aren't going to be happy doing the thing they did yesterday just because it's what was always done. They speak to me of restlessness and urgency. Um, but I want to add another word to those three, and that word is do. I was in a museum strategy workshop a few years ago with the eminent writer Robert Edsel, and Pete Wilson, who's the governor of California, and a lot of eminent historians and scholars and business people. And um, even though I was way, way, way out of my league, I was going on and on about how important it was uh, for this particular museum with this particular mission to succeed, to rise above its own rhetoric about inspiration and dreams and challenge, to really serve humanity to really win using the internet at global scale. And when I finally stopped to draw in a breath and uh, ponder the awkward silence in the room, 
uh, Robert Edsel, who is this intense, um, scholarly looking, distinguished gentleman with, with shocking white hair and a very impressive suit, um, straightened up next to me and said, in the words of Yoda, try not, do. And I thought that was totally awesome. We need all the inspiration we can get uh, because of the work of society and humanity in the not too distant future is going to get so much harder and so much weirder and so much more full of uh, ambiguity and frustration and dead ends than it's ever been before. And I think we need big, beautiful dreams now because we can have them thanks to the internet. And challenge, I'm not sure if you mean as a noun or a verb. Uh, if you mean it as a verb, then you're challenging what you see. If you mean it as a noun, a challenge, then yes, it is. All of this is a challenge, uh, but it's the only game in town and you're the only players and you've got to win. You must do, you must do starting now. Thanks. And one more slide. I had to close with the McCown. It seemed to be topical. Uh, one of the reasons we do what we do is to make a social contribution, to show people we care, to provide context from history and the present, to forge thinking about our collaborative future in this digital age. I think now it's time to go home, involve and inspire your bosses and your colleagues. Dream a little challenge your community, and do. Thanks very much. Thank you, Andy. Thanks, Bob. Poorly wrapped, I know, but that's on behalf of the board for the last 10 years. Uh, thank start. you for all your work. <laughs> I almost bought it last week. That's it? I almost bought it last right, week. Right, I'm glad you, you probably digitised half of it. <laughs> Thanks, man. Um, just before you all go, we'll do some housekeeping and then a few thanks. Um, housekeeping, coats are in the foyer, I told you that. Um, coming up after the conference, we'll have a post-conference survey going out to all your fine delegates. Uh, coming soon, all these talks are going to be on YouTube and we will get that done. Um, Twitter has been going off today. I think we've been number one in New Zealand. Um, so if anybody wants to store a fight, go for it. Um, somebody's created an archive of it all on Google Docs. So you can find it there if you want. Uh, speaker slides and notes are starting to trickle their way onto the internet. Um, so we'll be tweeting, tweeting them. If you've got links you want to share, just send them along to, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody. Um, I should have an uh, email address. Well, you, you can find us through our website or just tweet us, you know. Um, I've got to give lots of thanks. Uh, I will forget people, but I have to thank everybody for coming. I have to thank the program committee. Where are you? Courtney and Simon and Adrian and Virginia for helping me put this together. It's not all on me, it's all on you as well. I um, have to thank, thank the board for keeping on doing this thing. I've got to thank the speakers. Um, we. We got you here, but then you did all the work. Um, thank you so much. Sponsors, it does come down to money. Uh, money keeps this thing ticking along, so thank you for all your generous financial support. And then the Party Coopers team, um, who kept it all ticking along, um, registered us, fed us, organized everything. The AV teams have recorded everything, set up all the, the infrastructure, and of course to Papa for feeding us and hosting us and housing us for the last two days. I've enjoyed it, I hope you have too. Um, there's a pub just over there that some of us will be at quite soon. You're welcome to join us. Thank you, and we'll see you next year.